loosely, uh, well, not loosely, it's going to basically take the last topic of NPV and WAC and just apply it to a foreign venture. All right, so it's not that, it's not really a stretch at all. And the only other thing it adds in is we need to forecast exchange rates to convert all the cash flows into dollars. That, that's it. It's really pretty simple. Uh, the case is going to throw a few more wrinkles in that, though, but we'll just kind of get the basics today. All right? Um, any questions before we start? You okay? Anything you want to review? You good? All right. So here's just a review problem here is how to launch a business in Indiana, not India. Recap three years of uh, EBIT, EBIT of 25 million, a little bit of depreciation, some CapEx, some working capital. All right. So uh, this is uh, Caterpillar. All right. So Caterpillar wants to do another plan in Indiana. All right, so what they're going to do is they're first going to calculate, uh, since it's the same business risk as Caterpillar's business, we're just going to calculate their WAC. So let me grab one of these pens here. So they're first going to calculate the cost of equity. It's going to be the risk-free rate plus the firm's beta times the market risk premium. I generally use 5%. I think the number's between 4 and 6. I have no idea what it is between 4 and 6, so I, so I just usually settle on 5. So that means that a, a shareholder at Caterpillar should demand 10.5% based on the risk of Caterpillar business. All right? They have a relatively high beta, all right, which you would think. Big industrial equipment, economy turns bad, that stuff goes, doesn't sell very well. And then we're going to calculate their cost of debt. We'll say the risk-free rate is 2%, and then for their uh, uh, risk, say similar firms with their risk rating have about a 4% debt spread or credit spread. So we'll say, okay, their, their debt holders should demand 6%. Okay, Chris? Um, so it says that CATS, uh, Caterpillar's credit spread is 4%. So uh, what that means is I would look up Caterpillar and I'd find out that they're maybe a double B industrial firm. And I could find, I'll show you in a minute, I can show, find some data sets that say for a double B industrial firm, roughly their cost of financing a project with debt is about 4% above treasuries. So I'll just take 4% plus a long-term treasury and I'll call that their long-term cost of debt. Okay. Yeah. So then I'll uh, calculate the WAC. There's my cost of equity. There's my cost of debt. There's my tax rate. All right. Uh, okay. So where did I get this? All right. This is a trick that we did last year. Uh, where's the information here? The DDE ratio for Caterpillar, the D to E equals 0.6. All right. You remember this trick? The DDE ratio is not the debt percentage. The debt percentage is D over D plus E, not D over E. So one way of saying if their D to E is a ratio of 0.6 to 1, 0.6 of debt for every 1 of equity, that means D plus E equals 1.6. Therefore, the equity percent is 1 over 1.6. So you'll see that trick showing up at a bunch of places. What firms generally announce or quote is their DDE ratio, but what we need in the WAC is the equity percent and the debt percent, not the debt over equity percent. All right, so again, there's a difference between this is not equal to this. All right, D over E is not D over E plus D, okay? So I get a WAC of 791. I plug in my cash flows, 100 today. I calculate based on the uh, EBIT tax rate, CapEx, and all that. And that meant my cash flows are actually 15 a year. And I take the present value of those four cash flows and say it's negative $6 million. All right, so don't do it. I don't know why I keep making examples you don't want to do it, but it just don't do it, all right? Now, what if this project was not in Indiana, it's in India? 
and the cash flows weren't in dollars, they're in rupee. Well, we have to convert these cash flows into dollars somehow. And bottom line, I would just forecast the exchange rates using one of my models, say interest rate parity. What I probably would really do is probably just look at the forward exchange rates. Just go to Bloomberg and see what the forward rate is one, two, three, four years from now. Use those exchange rates, convert all the cash flows to dollars. And then the trick is, well, what do we do with the WAC? And there's a few solutions to that problem. All right. So let's talk about how, how you can kind of adjust for these projects that are international. All right. First of all, oh my God, look at that. There's the review of all the formulas we had from last year's class, how to calculate free cash flows, calculate NPV, how to calculate WAC, how to unlever a beta, relever a beta, cap M. Um, here is my growth perpetuity, and here is my free cash flow multiple valuation. Those are all the formulas you would need. What I forget? Oh, all right. So, well, how would I? All right. So. D over E, well that's not a formula, so how would I write that? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something like this, right? The debt percent is the DDE over one plus the DDE. I think that's right. Uh, how do, you, how do you remember that from last year? I can't remember what I have for breakfast. All right. Yeah, that's doing this little conversion here. All right. Thank you. I forgot about that. All right. So let's, uh, let's talk about what we're going to do. When we go to Indiana from India, or India from Indiana, why, why are we so afraid and think about India as being different? Well, we think that some these other countries are less developed in the US, or at least just different, uh, they're just riskier. Like, why? Well, we, we call that concept country risk. The risk of operating in another country, we just call it country risk. Why is it risky? Well, there could be a currency crisis. For no other reason, currencies fluctuate. But if you're operating in the US, you don't care about exchange rates. But if you're operating in another country, exchange rates hit your cash flow. So you worry about a currency crisis or just any kind of change uh, in exchange rates. When you're worrying, working in other countries, especially, say, some less stable South America, Central America, African Asian nations, you worry about maybe possibilities of expropriation. Expropriation just means the government takes over your firm. So they say, hey, thanks for building that power plant for a billion dollars. Uh, we decided that you're exploiting us and we want to take that. Thank, thanks. And that does happen. All right, so you have to worry about that. There's legal risk. All right, there's the risk that not the government per se, the leaders don't make a choice and say we're going to kick out all the foreigners and take all their assets. The courts do. So there's a ruling that you're, you're, you're harming the people in a certain way, your unfair labor practices, therefore we're going to tax you, penalize you, force you out of business, and by the way, if, by the way, if you just kind of give us your business, we'll let you go. Right, this is a, uh, I, kinda, I might mention this story before, but uh, on legal risk, I want to ask an ExxonMobil guy, he, was talking, he did a presentation on this, this, this uh, infrastructure project he did in Africa. And I said, what's the riskiest country you do business in? He goes, America. I'm like, ah, that's stupid. He goes, yeah, he goes, America, the riskiest thing about America is I build a plant and, uh, you know, I, someone trips on the sidewalk out front and I'm stuck in courts and, uh, you know, people that work for me are suing me for all kinds of reasons and their shareholder suing me. Everyone's suing me in America. <laughs> <laughs> right. So he goes, that's my biggest risk. I'd rather work in a... <laughs> in a country outside of America just because I don't have this, this, this strange legal system of America. There's also trade barriers, right? You set up a plant to produce goods in North Korea um, and then they're blocked or maybe it's another country, probably not Iran or South North Korea, something less obvious. Uh, there's changes in regulation. You set up this uh, plant and uh, all of a sudden the host country says, oh, we have new environmental standards. I told you that would be okay, but i uh, tell you the truth, we, that, that's obsolete. That, that won't work anymore. Um, changes in taxation. So why would a country ever 
ex, you know, come in with, with guns and take over your factory. All they can do is pass a law and say foreign uh, energy companies have to pay a 99% income tax. It's a lot easier, right? It, effectively, it's the same thing. You're kind of taking over all the cash flows from the business. You have just general economic problems, say, you know, in changes in inflation, exchange rate risk, economic crisis. And then there's this whole terrorism, violence, crime issue uh, in some nations, you know, especially Africa and South America uh, in particular. Um, and there's just infrastructure problems that you build a factory, it's all running up, and then you realize you only get power four hours a day, the roads aren't maintained, the airport uh, doesn't have air traffic controllers, there's no educational system to get an educated workforce, there's no clean water, uh, things like this. You know, basic infrastructure we take for granted. All this stuff is country risk. All, right. All this stuff is why we think if we go somewhere besides the developed world, you know, outside of U.S., Canada, Western Europe, Scandinavia, uh, Japan, South Korea, and once we get out of that list of kind of the, the well-functioning developed economies, there's parts of this, and therefore the project must be riskier, and therefore we have to value it differently. Does that, does that make sense? All right. Uh, when we get back together in next. March. Uh, we're going to explode this section. This slide becomes a kind of a two-hour presentation and you're all going to do country risk analysis uh, on the Middle Eastern region and Israel in particular. All right, that's what that course is about. It's how to do country risk analysis at a detailed level. All right, so we think doing country business in other countries is riskier. All right, and in most cases, you know, in many cases it is. Uh, so one thing we can do, we can just add a sovereign risk premium to our WAC. So what's a sovereign risk premium? Well, if uh, in Brazil, you know, their long-term treasuries, you know, their, their sovereign 10-year treasury rate, whatever they call it, is say 9%. In the US, it's say 3%. We take the difference, 6%, and we could just say, you know what, that must, we'll just use that as a proxy for risk, right? Why does Brazil have a higher rate on their bonds? Because they could default and a lot of bad things could happen. Therefore, investors demand a higher rate of return on Brazilian bonds. So I'll just use that information to say, well, if investors in government debt want 6% higher, I'll just demand 6% higher on my WAC. So that's one way to solve this problem. Just use Caterpillar's existing WAC and just add a sovereign risk premium based on every country. Except you probably don't do it for all the developed nations. You just do it for the less developed nations. Right. You're not going to get, do it for Canada, and you're not going to do it for Great Britain, and France, and Germany, and all those. You just do it for those countries you're concerned about. All right? Uh, by the way, when we kind of get to that section in, in March, there is a whole industry of people that measure country risks. So they took all these factors together, they come up with some weighting scheme, and they say, okay, the green are the good countries, which is basically U.S., Canada, Scandinavia, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and the rest are riskier. So if you look at the red places, there are places you probably don't open up a coffee stand. All right, so we're talking Syria and, and, and Central Africa and uh, Venezuela. So this is, these are these kind of, this is one of the companies that does this, um, and they kind of have the, the nice colorings. And so one way of thinking about it is all those places that are not in green, we should probably think about doing a, some kind of adjustment to the WAC because I think they're riskier. But there's a caveat, right? Look at China. China's kind of in the middle there. So they're saying, you know, China has some risk. It's riskier than the U.S. But on the other hand, they have the same, roughly the same risk of their debt. That becomes a problem sometimes that the risk of operating in China and the risk of buying a Chinese bond are different. And some countries it's roughly the same, like, you know, kind of Russia is, is both kind of a risky country risk and also kind of a risky sovereign bond buy. And, you know, and most of, you know, Scandinavia and North America and Australia and Japan, they're generally pretty safe places to buy bonds and pretty safe places to open businesses. But there are some disconnects that, Chinese bond is very safe. They will pay off their bonds. They have a very good fiscal order there, but doing business there might be riskier. All right. 
Uh, this just gives you an idea, like if you, uh, if you, you can, every country has a, a rate, well, most countries have ratings on their bonds. So you can look here and say U.S. is a double A rated bond. Some, some of us have, some of them have triple A, some are double A depending on the firm. But the, the obvious triple uh, A rated firms or triple A rated countries in the world are Canada, uh, the Scandies, uh, Scandinavia, Germany, Great Britain, most of uh, Western Europe's doing pretty well. China, Australia, um, Chile. Chile is generally pretty the safest place in South America. So, uh, uh, so these are kind of the safest bonds in the world. All right. And if you look up a country, say Brazil, it looks like they have a triple B rating from S and P. You can then go to this schedule and say, oh, triple B, what is a different schedule? That would be, triple Bs would be right about here. So triple Bs roughly have a 2% spread above treasuries, and therefore you can kind of use that as kind of the sovereign risk premium. Just kind of give you an idea of kind of just, if I, if I just look at the risk of a country's bond and assume that's the same risk as operating there, I can then get their rating and then just map it back to some extra 2% that I'll add to my WAC. All right, and this is probably the standard way of doing this. All right. So your Apple's launching a new venture in Brazil, has the same risk. What WAC do they use? Well, Apple's WAC is, say, 8.85. U.S. Treasuries are 3. Brazilian treasuries are 12, therefore I'm just going to add 9 plus 8 and call that 17%. All right, so that's pretty simple. The case you're going to do next week is all about this process, except it does it by industry. There's a firm that has four different business lines. Each one of them has a different whack. They're also looking at different countries. They're also looking to do some other funky things in that case. So you're going to... You're basically going to come up with a recommendation is how does this firm, AES, uh, how should it design a strategy to adjust its WAC based on the risk of the country and the business? That's the basic case. All right. All right. Any questions so far? I know I went through a whole bunch here. All right. Some alternatives. So this is the default model, I believe, is kind of using the sovereign risk premium. Here are some other things that firms do do or could do. There's one theory that says, forget everything about foreign, foreign risk. Just use the domestic WAC. If it's, your in if it's in your industry, just use your domestic WAC. Uh, one justification is every firm, to some extent, has a lot of international business. Therefore, their current WAC is kind of a global WAC, so just use it. All right, that's one justification. Uh, another one is, you know what, if I do business in South America and Asia and Africa and Eastern Europe, I'm going to kind of diversify all that risk away, all right, as long as I'm not just in one region. Therefore, you know what, maybe all that country risk kind of is a wash, so forget it. And the last one is, well, you know what, once I put that project together, I'm going to buy insurance, I'm going to do foreign exchange hedges, I'm going to do all this effort to mitigate the risk. Therefore, I really think I'm going to wind up mitigating most of the risk, so just use the domestic WAC. So I think there's a strong argument that you should never, you should just use your domestic WAC. Don't adjust it by country, because I think the, uh, the sovereign risk premium which largely measures the probability that the bond's going to default or have a major currency crisis, you can hedge most of that away. Uh, a little technical note. Instead of just taking WAC plus sovereign risk premium, the case you're going to work on this week, it just does it a slightly different way. It takes KE plus sovereign risk premium plus KD plus sovereign risk premium times one minus tax and, and does it in two separate pieces versus just adding it to the end. All right, so just look for that in the case. The only advan the only difference is you get the debt uh, on the you get the uh, the tax yield effect on the adding the sovereign risk premium to the cost of debt. It's a small technical thing, but I'm just going to highlight it out there that some firms just add a sovereign risk premium to the overall WAC. 
So I'm add it to KE and KD separately and just throw it in the WAG. All right. And then lastly, some people get out of the whole discount rate business, kind of like the above, and any risk you just got to put it into the cash flows. So if you're thinking about the currency is going to devalue, just put different exchange rates into the cash flows. Right? If you think there's a 10% chance of expropriation, just factor all the cash flows down by 10%. And don't put it into the discount rate. That's the, so this is, these are your choices for dealing with foreign, uh, foreign country risk. All right. So here's just a silly example. Well, I shouldn't say silly, just a trivial example. First, she's going to put a supply chain facility in Ghana. The project's going to cost $9.90 today. You expect the most likely cash flow is $100 next year. It's going to be a one-year project to make this really simple. The WAC for Hershey is 9%. The sovereign risk premium is 3%. So we're going to use a 12% discount rate. This $100 lasts forever. It's a perpetuity. So I'm going to assume that this $100 lasts forever. So I'm going to take my, you know, that last cash flow and divide by K minus G. Remember that formula? The growth perpetuity formula? Present value forever. And when I do that, I take my WAC plus my sovereign risk premium, subtract out my infinite growth rate. It says that project has a $10 NPV. All right. But you can take that same information and do it a different way. What if you, es you estimate that the major risk of operating over there is expropriation? The, gov the government steps in and takes control of the assets somehow. And you estimate that there's a 5% chance of that happening. Well, why don't I just take an expected cash flow of 95? That's adjusting for the risk of expropriation. But I'm not going to add three to the WAC because I'd be double counting the risk. I'm putting the risk through the cash flows and not through the discount rate. There's a lot of people that are proponents of everything should go through the cash flows because that, that, that sovereign risk premium is like this blunt mallet. Like you're not really sure what that 3% does right here. It just makes all the cash flows worth less and you don't even know how to, what to think about that 3%. So, but if you can figure out how the risk of that country affect cash flows and adjust the cash flows, that's the way to go. So I think like McKinsey and a few others kind of really push that don't mess with the whack, mess with the cash flows. Because that makes you focus on your business and the exact risk. And you can see you get a wildly different number. Right. Or maybe you do it both ways. I'm, I'm a more of a proponent of doing it. If you're not sure which way to do it, do it both ways and just have a discussion. Yeah. Can't. So you couldn't. But here's what you could do if you have solver on your Excel. You could solve what what prob what expropriation probability makes it a, neg a zero NPV project, and then figure and say that number turns out to be uh, uh, twenty percent and say, is there more or less than a 20% chance this government takes my, all my assets? So that's another kind of a way of getting around that is, is actually solve that, you know, basically make this a variable here that's 95% and figure out what does that number have to be for this to be break even and then say, well, there's no more, it can't be a 20% chance they're going to take my assets. That, that's probably what I would do. All right. So that's everything about adjusting for country risk. Either use that blunt instrument of a sovereign risk premium. It really just measures the risk of owning a country's bonds, but we just kind of hope it's a proxy for all these other factors. Right? And we just kind of hope it is, and you know what, it's really easy to do, therefore just do it. I mean, I could do all the homework, or I can just Google what the Brazilian bond yield is, and I'd be done. All right. Now let's talk about how to deal with currencies. Presumably, if you're doing business abroad, you're going to have foreign currencies. 
and you're going to have to convert those. The only way you can do an NPV, everything has to be in dollars, right? When an NPV that's in dollars, so you've got to convert all the currencies back to dollars. There's two main ways of doing it. One would be use interest rate parity formulas, just forecast the exchange rate every year. The other way is just use forward exchange rates and assume that they're a pretty good predictor. And that's, that's pretty much it. So here's, a, here's a, an example of using my model of interest rate parity. All right, Bear is looking to do an investment in Chile. All right, I know they're not an American firm, let's just pretend they are. Uh, <clears throat> so Bear is looking to do an investment in Chile. It's going to cost 100,000 Chilean pesos today. It's going to give you 120,000 Chilean pesos one year from now. The current exchange rate is 450 pesos per dollar. That's the spot price. So I took 100,000 pesos times 1 over 450, or I'll just divide it. This is the U.S. dollar cost today. You okay with that? That's just doing a quick conversion of multiplying pesos times the dollar per peso exchange rate, which is the same thing as dividing by 450. Then the question is, what do I do for next year's cash flow? It's 120,000 pesos. Well, I could just divide by next year's exchange rate. Well, what is next year's exchange rate? Well, I could use interest rate parity. If today's exchange rate is 450, and the peso interest rate is 7%, and the dollar interest rate is 3%, I'll just use this exchange rate next year, and that'll convert all of this into dollars. And I'll just kind of discount that at some discount rate. That's just one way of doing it, just using that interest rate parity model. I think that's the... The second most common way to do it is just use the interest rate parity model. Probably the most common way is just go to Bloomberg and look at the one year forward, which is usually pretty close to the interest rate parity value anyway. But if I didn't have a Bloomberg, I'd probably use interest rate parity. All right, any, you okay with that? So, Caterpillar in India. Oh my goodness. It's going to cost 800 million rupee today to build a plant in India. Say they're buying it. You're going to get EBIT of 250 million rupee, tax rate of 30%, depreciation of 150, capex of 100, working capital of 80. So I got my EBIT times my one minus tax rate. That's my no pat. Net operating profit after tax. Uh, no pat, doesn't matter. I'm going to add my depreciation back. I'm going to then subtract out my capex and subtract out changes in working capital. So that project is going to generate 145 million rupee per year starting one year from now. Those, this, this, so this is my cash flow one equals 145 million rupee. Cash flow two, we're just going to assume it grows at 15% for year two, and then grow at 3% forever. That's my infinite growth rate. So there's all my cash flows. I'm going to get 145 million rupees next year, pay 800 million rupees today. Cash flows grow at 15% in that first year, and then they're going to grow at 3% forever. All right, here's some information on uh, Caterpillar's uh, uh, tax rate, beta, debt spread, DED ratio, and so on. All right, well, it's, it's a little bit hard. Here's the solution on the next slide, but I just kind of did it like this so I can paste it into Excel. Here's the cash flow, year zero. Here's my 145. Cash flow in year one. That cash flow then grows at 15%. There's my cash flow in year two. That cash flow grows at 3%. That's my cash flow in year three. So now I have all my cash flows. Let's go back and read this. CAT's tax rate is 40%, beta of 1.6, debt, debt spread of 3%. CAT's DE ratio is 0.6. U.S. interest rate is 2. Market risk premium is 5. There's the spot price of the rupee today. 
Uh, the new investment will have a different DDE ratio as the firm. So now I got everything going on here. All right, projects in India, I'm going to finance it using a different capital structure. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the company's beta and unlever it. So this would be the, the beta of CAT if they had no debt. Right, it's their unlevered beta. I'm then going to re-lever it based on the project's DDE ratio. So that would be the beta of cat with new DDE. So their beta, existing beta is 1.7. If they had no debt, it would be 125. But with this debt, it would be 1.6. So now you have the beta of this business unit. I then plug that in my CAPM formula, risk-free rate plus beta times market risk premium. <laughs> I take my cost of debt, which is the risk-free rate plus my debt spread. And then I just plug it into my WAC formula. Last step, and I just add the sovereign risk premium. You have uh, uh, Indian interest rates are 11%, U.S. are 2 so I'm going to just add 9% as a sovereign risk premium. And that's one way that you can come up with a WAC for Caterpillar in India. Use Caterpillar's beta, unlever it, then relever it. Use the new project's debt to equity ratio and use the sovereign risk premium. So I'm going to evaluate that project at 17%. All right, so we have the cash flows in rupee. We have the WAC for India. And then the last trick is, well, these are in rupee. All right, I need dollars. It's hard to do anything with rupee in America. I can't buy a soda. You know, it doesn't work at uh, the bars. So I need to convert these to dollars. The current spot price of the, price of the rupee is 55 rupee per dollar. In one year, it should be 59. In two years, it should be 65. In three years, it should be 70. So I should, all I have to do is apply those exchange rates to the rupee cash flows in year one, two, three. That sounds easy to say, but that's all I'm doing here. I'll convert the today's cash flow with the spot price. So I'll convert the rupees I'm going to spend today to build to buy this plant using the spot price of the of the rupee. I'll convert this rup, next year's rupee at next year's forecasted spot price the following years at the next years, and so on. I discount all of this at my 17%, which is my WAC for India. And looks like I'm doing a growth perpetuity. It's going to grow at 3% growth forever, infinite growth rate. And I get a valuation for my India project. Adjusting for the risk of India, which is cap captured in the sovereign risk premium. Adjusting for the expected exchange rates, using my interest rate parity formulas. And now everything's in dollars and adjusted for India risk, I think. Does that, that sound reasonable? Yes? So the 11% and 2%, that's the sovereign premium. That's actually the, that's actually the rate on Indian bonds, long-term bonds is 11%. The uh, the U.S. is two percent, so it's actually say the the, the long term the ten year Treasury rate and the ten year Indian sovereign rate. I don't know what they call their their sovereign bonds. So it, so it's so eleven percent is the interest rate on ten year uh, uh, government issued rupee bonds. Yeah, it's not the premium. The premium would be nine the difference. So the risk premium would be eleven minus two. Yeah, so the exchange rate next year is the exchange rate today times 1 plus R over 1 plus R. This is rupees per dollar, so 55 rupee per dollar. So I just put the rupee interest rates and the U.S. interest rates, and I forecasted the exchange rate each year. 
So this would be kind of a simplistic model of how do I evaluate this foreign project with foreign currencies and it's a little riskier uh, place. All right, any, any other questions? You okay? On the bottom of that equation, um, there's a 166.75, Yeah, yeah let, me, let me write this, maybe, let me write it this way just to help and then we'll talk about it. I, again, I, I, the, only read, the only reason I write it this way is because I paste it into Excel to get a solution. So let me write it a little bit better. It's minus 800 rupees times today's dollar over rupee exchange rate, which is 1 over 55, plus 145 rupees next year times next year's exchange rate. Oops. 59. Point eight five. So that's the amount of dollars I'll get next year. But I need to divide all of that by 1.1704. That would be the present value of the dollars I'm receiving next year. Plus, I'm going to have 166 rupees two years from now times a dollar per rupee exchange rate, which is one over 65.134. All right, so that's the amount of dollars I'm gonna get two years from now. Now, this cash flow now grows at 3% forever. So I did a little shortcut here. I could have ca captured the cash flows in year three, then done a growth perpetuity. But once you know that's the cash flow that grows forever, you just you can stop it and say, let's just do a growth perpetuity now. So this cash flow grows at 3% forever. So let's just say one, whoops. Let's just divide by K minus G. You okay? That'll give me the, in, the value of an infinite series that starts in year two and goes on forever. But that will give me the value of that cash flow one year before it starts. If you kind of remember from last year, anytime you use a growth perpetuity, it doesn't give you the value in year zero. It gives you the value of the year before it starts. So my last step is I need to discount back this one more year. This takes it, this is the present value of all cash flows in year one, I need to bring it back to year zero. So I'm going to discount it for one more period. And that's how I get it. Does that, does that help? Right. Um, I'd probably not use this method if I didn't have to. I would probably go to Bloomberg and just get the one year, two year, three year forward pips and just use that instead of a model. That's probably what I would use. So I think maybe one of the problems I gave you like forward pips and you don't use the model, you're just gonna use the forward rate. But sometimes you just, it's easier to use the, the model, the interest rate parity model. All right, so when, if I were to use say this exchange rate, Actually, here's a good question. I, actually, I wouldn't even do that to you. If this firm is generating, I don't even, you don't need to know this, but if this firm is generating rupee revenue next year, they're going to sell rupee and get dollars. Right? So they're going to get so X rupee next year. And the question is, how many dollars are they going to receive? When they go to, and, and when they go to a financial institution, they're going to get screwed. Right? When IBM goes to a financial institution, they get screwed just like we get screwed at TravelX. So they're going to get the lowest dollar per rupee exchange rate, which is actually one over the highest rupee per dollar exchange rate. So it's actually going to be the ask. What is the ask for next year? Well, the spot price is 64.000. That's three decimal places. 
I'm going to add 723.994. And that is the forward price I would use if I were to use the forward prices. That's kind of combining kind of last week's topic with this week's topic. You're always observing, you're always looking at these forward pips and trying to do something with them. All right, so if I were using forward, I'd use this 64. Well, that's really easy. I can even do this math. <laughs> All right, I would use that. Now, so the bottom, everything, make sure when you're doing the problems, you have to convert all the cash flows to dollars. All right, we can't have an NPV that mixes rupees, and, and sometimes I mix it up that the, you know, the, 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 the product is, is produced in China, so there's yuan cost. It's sold in Europe, and there's euro revenue, and there's some U.S. costs. So you kind of just have to convert everything back to dollars and calculate an NPV using forward rates. Uh, just for fun, if you want to see this, I did a similar model that we just did, but I did it in Excel, but there's no reason to go through it. It's really what we just did. Um, and I did a little, uh, for you, for you, Sam, I did a little data table right there, right? All right. That gets me out of the problem of, well, you don't really know all the answer to these problems. Yeah, you're right. Well, the two biggest uncertainties. Uh, I don't know what the soft, I don't know what the real discount rate is, and I don't know what the perpetual growth is. All right, well, put reasonable ranges and just look at it and just make a, a decision looking at the possibilities. And it looks like uh, you know, only for discount rates over 15% and growth rates, uh, you know, so you can kind of say, well, I think the feasible range of those two values, it's gonna be positive NPV, so let's just do it. So get out of the world of having to figure out what the exact value is, just kind of do some sensitivity analysis and, and, and discuss it with, with, with everyone and just make a decision. Because in finance, you just can't figure out these values. They're, they're an R. But we think, we think there's a range. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at one of the types of problems you have. Um, actually, let's take a look at, I've already posted your assignment. Let's go to Canvas. Let's just make sure that it looks good. Um, it's a really, it's a shorter assignment, a little bit shorter, but the case is a little bit tougher. Is it out there? Did anyone see it? It's not? I thought I put it there. It's not there. All right, that, that's. Uh, let me take a look. You don't see that under assignments. What's that? Let me just make sure it's available. All right, is it there now? No? Right, let me see if I can just put it under files. Yeah. Is there? Oh. Oh, maybe I have to hold on. Thank you. I'm I'm getting to learn this system. I'm sorry. So under modules, it looks like a assignments. All right. All right. 
Yeah, I'm always, you know, I, I do worry about that, doing this in front of you, because I always go check and make sure it's not the solution. Is it there? And do you have, is it the solution? Let's find out, otherwise I'll make you delete it. All right, it's not the solution. All right, you got it now? All right. So uh, we have six problems, not too bad, right? Uh, they look a lot like the ones we just did, the longer ones. So Dow's looking to go in Argentina. You got peso cash flows of 100, and all in pesos. Cash flows will grow at 3% forever. So in this case, I just give you the domestic whack, tell you to add a sovereign risk premium, and do a growth perpetuity. All right. Um, here's one in Pakistan. It's going to cost 700 million rupee. Here's the rupee cash flows. Here's today's exchange rate. Here's the forward rates I give to you. Um, so again, it's just more of the same. Yeah, more of the same. So it's all about just uh, using, I'm either giving you the forward exchange rates uh, or giving, telling you the interest rate parity. And then a couple of the problems, you have to do the unlevering of beta, relevering of beta, and adding a sovereign risk premium. All right? Pardon me? <laughs> yeah, sure. All of them are extra. <laughs> the whole program is the extra credit. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I think that's it. So how about we just take a piece of paper and uh, draw a line through it. Any questions or concerns go to the bottom? When we get back to you this week, Let me think about that. Okay. Let, me think. okay. Let me think about that. Don't remind me of that. Yeah. Alright. Yeah, thank you. Let me I'm always nervous about kind of making digital copies of quizzes in case I ask questions again, but let me think about that. Yeah.